Welcome to a very special fun edition of Crawford County Outdoors. We were at Conneaut Lake today and we were talking about the extension of the Ernst Trail. It's now going to come out to Conneaut Lake and we're going to hear a presentation about it and then we're going to take a hike later on. So stick with us, it'll be a lot of fun. My name is Sandy Eldridge, and on behalf of the Connie Lake Garden Club, we would like to welcome the French Creek Recreational Trails Group and all of you for your interest in learning about the Ernst Trail that's coming to Connie Lake. It's very exciting. Um, first of all, we'd like to thank Joel Wolf for allowing us to use this venue. It's so appropriate. Thank you, Joel. You're welcome. And we'd like to mention that the winery is open until 740? Yeah, 745, that way we get out at 8. Okay, very good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> especially like to thank Calvin Ernst for providing the extra cover. Obviously, we needed it, so thank you very much. Um, we're pleased to have guest speakers Calvin Ernst, who is the president of Ernst Conservation Seeds Incorporated, and Agronomy Assistant Katie Flaherty speak, uh, present tonight's program and share their insight with us on the history and expansion of this exciting endeavor. I have to share with you um, the, is, the history of Calvin Ernst and Ernst Seeds. It's fascinating. And you may already know it, but just in case, here it is. <laughs> Calvin Ernst founded Ernst Crown Vetch Farms in 1962, growing Crown Vetch Seed, Crown Vetch Plugs, and Crown Vetch Propagules utilized by most Northeast and Central U.S. highway departments for erosion control and roadside beautification. Recognizing the limited market of crown vetch and the expanded use of natives in the environmental industry, the name was changed to Ernst Conservation Seeds Incorporated. What began as five acres of crown vetch currently includes nearly 10,000 acres and 400 species of native warm and cool season grasses, Forbes and bioengineering, that's live plant materials, for commercial utilization in wetland restoration, meadow establishment, bioretention, and wildlife and pollinator habitat. The company employs nearly 90 people, and sons Andy and Michael are actively involved with Calvin in leading the family business. Ernst Conservation Seeds is now the largest native seed producer in the eastern United States. <laughs> Katie Flaherty is an agron agronomy assistant and GIS coordinator at Ernst Conservation Seeds. Katie has held these positions since her graduation from Penn State University in 2020, where she earned a degree in biorenewable systems with an agricultural systems management option and a minor in off-road equipment, agronomy, and ag business management. Katie grew up in Somerset County and in high school worked at a nursery and sustainable landscape business, followed by positions at Pioneer Hybrid, Sturman Master Potato Farm, and Penn State Plant Pathology. As part of the Pennsylvania National Heritage Program, PA Natural Diversity Index, Katie conducted a botanical survey for the area south of the Carnet Lake Outlet along the former railroad to identify native and invasive plant species. This included determining the presence of rare and endangered species, which is a prerequisite for trail establishment. The Botanical Pedestrian Reconnaissance helps determine the ecological viability of the project and aids in further development. We are pleased that Katie's education and chosen field have led her to Crawford County. Tonight, she will walk us through some of the botanical efforts made to get the trail expansion off the ground, discuss native species to the Connaught Lake Outlet area, and potential selections for the trail. So now, if you'll please join me in welcoming Calvin Ernst and Katie Flaherty as they provide us with the history and all of the other wonderful insight into the Ernst Trail. You better have that. You yeah. better have it. <laughs> there you go. Well, uh, good evening. I have to say distinguished guests and, and, and club members and everybody else that's coming here. I see everybody from Lania Lake is here. <laughs> okay. I just, I actually have to keep some notes because you're, you're really looking at a lot of Lania Lake history right from here. We're acting on the, on the land 
that was the Clunyon Lake Railroad Station, and then they had the ice house straight across the stream, across the road. They had uh, they had a coal tipple there, and uh, but it all started with the canal in 1828, which is a, quite a long time ago. And it was actually the canal was wasn't completed until 1834. You have to realize this was all done by hand. That's the, that's the channel that's going right up along here. Okay. Well then, in 1880 the railroad grade became a, was bought by the Meadville Railroad Company for a, for a railroad from Meadville to Conyet Lake. Through mergers and acquisitions, it was transferred to the Bessemer and Lake Erie Railroad and then to the Canadian National Railroad. Since 1980, various parts have been sold to various landowners, including the land right here where we're, where we're at, uh, on this property right here because this was the old station and it was sold quite early in the whole program. But um, then in, in, in uh, 19, uh, 2022, excuse me, in 2022, the Canadian National Railroad petitioned the Pennsylvania PUC to discontinue the, the railroad and they sold all their interest in, in this section of Crawford County Sadbury and and Vernon and Union Township to Ernst. So uh, uh, that's when we started the the, the serious uh, building the, the trail to to, to Meadville. And uh, so that made it so we have a continuous railroad from from 322 to uh, Beans Gas Station, about 17 miles or something. Yeah, and. Um, don't be accurate on those miles. I've been trying to calculate miles today and it goes all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, walking, biking, hunting, uh, birding, you name it, you can do it out here. And we have a, because I own about three acres of the, of the original railroad lot, the, the uh, station down below here, I have a lot more parking, so when, there, when Joel runs out of parking, he can send his guests down there. <laughs> and uh, uh, I want to introduce Katie to, let's see, she has something on the screen here for us. Okay, so let me just get in here and show you a little bit. We're currently right here in, in, this, in this aspect of the, right about here is where we're right now. And... Um, this is, this is primarily the eastern, uh, east of Canyon Lake, Sadbury Township section of the, of the railroad. As you can see, it was still marked on old, um, old contour maps as, 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 as this is the railroad here. So and so right now, we have <coughs> upgraded to this point here, which is uh, Mc, Michael, or McMichael Road or, or Brown Hill Road. <laughs> yeah, I touched the screen. Huh? There, there we go. So right there, that that's how much is 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 the is the current project. Then then we have a, an extensive development started on this section from West Vernon Road or the West Vernon Station. You know, this used to be an onion station. You realize that Crawford County was a major onion producing area. In, in, and the railroad shipped the onions to New York and Chicago and Pittsburgh and what have you, right from here. Plus the ice. You, mean, you gotta remember, this is the biggest natural lake in Pennsylvania. It produced a lot of ice right out here. But now we're talking about before refrigerators. Okay, so then I just had to go back into that. Then we're into a little section here in, on West Vernon Road uh, this is pretty good shape right here, right now. Uh, the Hotchkiss family has been developing that for us. And then I've been working through here, but there's a few places that's a little bit wet and we're, we're working on grading it up and what have you. And then we'll continue to connect to the, to the Bailey Road station right here. This is Watson Run, and we have some applications in for a bridge over Watson Run, some funding for a bridge over Watson Run, and then we also have some 
request in for a funding over Route 19, which is just west of Interstate 79. And we're going to bore under that. We're going to we're going to over the river and through the road. <laughs> okay. And uh, so that's in the plans. Um, I guess while I'm I'm harping on things here, I would like to see if the Kanye Lake Division <laughs> couldn't uh, have a, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, put together some kind of a maintenance crew because there's always trees falling, there's always brush to cut, there's always um, weeds to pull, you know how it is, it's a garden. So uh, that's, that's kind of what, I'm, what I've got to say for this evening. I'll get, turn it right over to Kate here. All right, well I will piggyback right off of what Calvin was talking about. Is this now working a little bit better? Okay. So on the left hand side, I don't know how far I can get, is kind of where we started. Uh, so it was a real bed and it still is a real bed. Uh, the only difference is that as things have not been mowed and not been maintained, it's just like your neighbor who doesn't generally mow their grass when they should. Things get a little bit dirty, but it, it's still functional. And so when we went in, we went, and before we had done any mowing, any clearing, uh, we went in and got different, uh, we had this botanical survey done. And so then in the middle, you can kind of see some of the median time frames where we had gotten it graded off, but it still looks like a railroad bed. And this was taken, oh, two days ago with the puppy dog, and we walked, oh, about to the onion parking lot, which is, I think, what we're going to be calling that, um, and kind of reevaluated it. And in, the interesting thing is I found more plants two days ago, and I walked out here to pull some weeds because I didn't know if the projector was working, and I found more different species. <laughs> so it's just like anything. You, you keep on going out and you're going to find different things. So part of getting this project up and running is we had to do some paperwork. And some of this paperwork included <coughs> creating an erosion and sediment control plan, water resources reports, taking a look at Conneaut Lake and Conneaut Outlet. And they're incredibly valuable water resources. And figuring out how this is a feasible project right next to those water resources. Um, we had to do a PNDI, which I'll get into that, a material feasibility. So what kind of material as far as your ground that you're walking on? And the interesting thing is if you've taken a walk down the trail and all the slag, that was brought in oh, when the railroad was built. And it makes quite a soft rail bed. And so most of the material there, material there allowed us to keep a, a, a firm bed because essentially the rail bed was there, it's an impervious surface, and at the end of this it's still going to be an impervious surface. And there is some vegetation coming in, but the interesting thing is most of the vegetation that is coming in are native species in certain areas. So the botanical survey was done through the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program. And so this is a combination effort with the Department of Conservation Natural Resources, the Fish and Boat Commission, the Pennsylvania Game Commission, US Fish and Wildlife Services, and the Pennsylvania Department of Conservancy. And so this is an online resource that kind of screens projects for <coughs> animal species, plant species, uh, aquatic species, and takes a look at the different regions and areas that might be affected for a project. And so this is anywhere, if you're putting in a septic, you might have to run this. If you're putting in a parking lot, you have to run this. And it's a really good tool to look and see what kind of natural species are we getting into. So, a little bit about birds. Now, I am no birder, but if anyone is, I would love someone to tell me what birds I'm hearing. Because I, I walked and I looked for these species of birds, and I did not find any, but I'm not an expert birder. 
but hopefully these are the ones that the, the department outlined as ones that we need to pay attention to. So some of the things that we can do as a trail is make sure that the invasive species aren't crowding out their food sources and working in specific time frames throughout the year. Other species are mussels and fish. And I didn't decide to get wet and dig for mussels, but there are groups that will be coming out here, here shortly to kind of do some exploration, especially now that the trail has uh, access points into areas of the marsh that they were not able to get to. All right, and so then the stuff that you guys are here for is the, the botanical survey. So they outlined six different species that we needed to look for. And the majority of these species are a cross between two different parents. Uh, for example, the small beggar ticks, the bidens, I'm going to be jumping in between Latin and common for this whole presentation. I, Calvin taught me, so I apologize for that. <laughs> um, and so the bidens, uh, this, this, the, this discoidea, it's a hybrid between a Biden's Aladdis and a Biden's Aristosa. And so some of these species, there are the parent species, um, but we didn't find the, uh, the hybridized species. And that's another example with the Equisetum ferricii, the rush. Again, it's a, it's a hybrid between two different Equisetum species. But the nice thing is, is if we can get some of these invasives cleaned up, there might be a chance for some of these to actually come up. Because the really cool thing about native species is the seeds are in the ground. And the seeds travel. Right before this, I walked down to pick these weeds up, and I got covered in seeds that had just stuck to me. So now I'm going to bring them over here, and I'm going <laughs> to shake them off, and I'm going to get in the car, and they're going to stick to the car. When I go home, they're going to be growing clear up by Conneautville. <laughs> when the next person who gets in the car gets in, they're going to be clear out at Guy's Mills. And that's how seeds spread, is people, dogs, birds. So most of the species here, I mean, it's, you almost know where they come from, but some of them you really have to wonder where they come from. So part of this survey was looking at the different areas. So have, have, have most of you guys have walked the trail, at least a little bit, down to the end? All right. So you know that it changes. It's not, it's not hiking parts of like the Appalachian Trail where you've got mountains and you've got hills. It's, you're hiking right next to a swamp. And so you get a little bit different species than you would hiking in the woods. And so part of that was taking a look and deciding, all right, where are are shaded areas, where are, are, are deciduous areas. You can't, well, this is just Google Images. Um, you can't really see that. But the different shades of green there, um, so this is done by the Crawford County Natural Heritage Inventory Group. And so the darker green are your areas of uh, high impact, and the lighter green are some vegetated areas. And so some of the species that you see on e underneath a whole bunch of oaks, completely shaded out, are not the species that you're going to see halfway between here and West Vernon Road, where it's fairly open. It's, it's a competitive. And the problem is, is invasive species are highly competitive. So some of, we're going to start with some of my favorite species. So we're going to run through some of these. I'll talk a little bit about them. Um, most of these species you have probably seen before. Um, so hopefully I can just put a name to some of them and give you a little bit informa more information about them. So currently blooming is Eastern Columbine. I don't know, can you guys see the little red one in the top left? So that one is blooming right now. That one likes trees. And so that one you'll find in shade. And so there's some of that whole I'll be honest, I did this botanical survey last year, and so I don't know the exact location of all of these species. Um, but when I went out, I was able to find quite a few of them just about 100 yards off of the parking lot here. Um, other weeds, other, not weeds, Calvin, 
other plants <laughs> um, is thimbleweed. And so thimbleweed it gets incredibly fuzzy when it matures. So if you go out in the fall and you see those little thimbles, that's your thimble. And you grab it and it just poofs out. Uh, rough avens, your GM, that grows almost just about anywhere. Um, and then the wild geranium, I'm sure you guys are pretty familiar with the little purple flower in the top right. And so that's a much better landscape option than your standard geranium as well. Uh, golden rods. So golden rods are one of the most important species for pollinators because it gives them energy to travel back down to Mexico for the butterflies because it has more, the, the sugars have a higher energy content. And so this is incredibly valuable for pollinators. And so some of these are, you'll recognize the Canada, Canadian golden rod, uh, blue stem golden rod, so that's Solidagosacea. So that one again you'll see under trees. Your early golden rod, so that'll be the first one to bloom. So in about mm, two to three weeks, you start seeing golden rod, it's more than likely going to be your early golden rod. And then rough leaf golden rod, oh I can name, th those have to be about 27 different golden rod species um, in Pennsylvania, if not more. We grow, what, 20 or so? And there, it's, you, you'll find one and you'll compare them and it's, Calvin could probably tell you just by, without the labels what each one of those is, but it's, it takes some, some time. All right, so Desmodium. So these are tick tree foils. If you've been hiking in the woods and you see the little green stickies that stick all to your clothing, not the, not the ones with the pitchforks, but the green ones, those are these guys. They're actually incredibly wonderful species. If you notice, the one in the middle is growing right out of the gravel. And so these are phenomenal species because they fix nitrogen as their legumes and they can grow in highly poor soils. So there's about three different ones here. Um, the trail has all three of them. Um, and so they have a variety of purple to pink to white flowers. And so those will bloom Oh, about mid-July. Um, asters, again, something you guys have definitely seen. Um, the one, most common ones you've probably seen walking along the trail are your heath, your calico, and your whitewood asters. Um, again, these range from whites to purples to blues. And again, a wonderful pollinator source. Uh, these kind of stretch the entirety of the trail. Um, along the roadsides. It's, it's one of those species that they float and they disperse. All right. For the wood people here, we've got a ton of different ferns. So we've got your sensitive ferns, and they actually grow in many different areas. I found one growing right in the middle of the parking lot. Um, but some of the other ones, like the shades, you've got your hay-scented fern, if you smell that. Early in the spring, it smells like peaches. And so there's oh, about five or six different ferns um, along the area. They kind of change depending um, on the shade levels. Uh, sedges and rushes, and so these are phenomenal bird food sources. Um, and so these you'll see kind of off the sides of the trail in getting closer into the canal. Um, and so ones that are in bloom now is a tussock sedge um, and Pennsylvania sedge. Uh, those, oh, and then the one on the top left hand side, which I can't remember what it is, so I didn't label it. But um, another ones you guys are probably familiar with is the beggar ticks on the right hand side. Those are the pitchforks that get stuck in your socks. And so those are Bidens, and so those will turn into a beautiful yellow flower, and then they make seeds, and then they stick to you. <laughs> and so that's, that one's a very um, annoying one. So I've, I've had to combine that one. I've gotten it all through my hair, so it's not fun. <laughs> um, other ones are Joe Pie weed, Iron Weed. So if you're driving by the fields, and you see the big purple and the big pink things in the fields, Joe Pie, 
and Iron Weed is probably most likely what they are. That Iron, Iron Weed is also called Queen of the Prairie. Um, I've heard some people around here call it that. Um, black Cohosh. For the people who know what like things like ginseng are, Black Cohosh is one of those interesting species that you can make money off of. But it's only about three dollars a pound, so you can get to what you want, but you probably won't get a whole lot. Which is why I put that in there. Um, other ones that I kind of enjoy are button bush. And so this one makes a beautiful white flower and it's incredi so f incredibly swampy areas. Um, St. John's wort um, and then your swamp agrimony. And so that'll be a bright yellow flower. Um, these are good landscaping alternative plants. So you have, most of you probably know what spirea is. So this is a native spirea, the meadow sweet. So Spirea alba and Spirea tomentosa. And so instead of planting that Spirea japonica, these two have way prettier flower, flowers and are natives. Um, another good alternative is a nine bark and an alder. Um, there are non-native alders, um, but there are native ones as well. So that kind of gets to another point. So what is a native species? So a native species is anything that existed in North America before the European settlers and it's here and it's not taking over an area to an extent where other species cannot survive. And that kind of brings you into another point because an invasive species is something that's not from North America or it's something that outcompetes other species. So you can have a native species that has turned invasive. And so that includes things like Virginia creeper, pokeweed, and sumac. Because Virginia creeper is a native plant, but it's not a highly desirable one to certain extents. It's, it's kind of like the definition of a weed. A weed is a plant that's not where it's supposed to be. <laughs> we don't grow weeds. Well, <laughs> but that's... It, Everyone says that Ernst grows weeds, but you know what? We grow plants for, for a specific purpose, and we do have weeds in our field, and that's just plants that we have problems with as much as you guys do. Um, so these are some things that are pretty bad landscaping plants that have kind of encroached out, and so these are your Japanese barberries, your Japanese honeysuckles, and your foxglove. So as pretty as foxglove is, it is a non-native species, and it is highly toxic. Um, your Japanese barberry, they are now prohibiting the sale of that in greenhouses just because it does encroach. And so I think they have about a year, a year left until they start uh, seizing the plants out of greenhouses. I don't quote me on that one. And all of these have, ha all, all of the three I had in front of them had incredibly wonderful alternatives that you could plant instead. Um, walking along here, just down, the first ones you'll see, this big yellow one um, is sweet clover. Uh, so that's kind of the main one that you'll see as you start walking. Uh, purple leaf strife, so that'll bloom in about two weeks. Um, butter and eggs are the itty bitty yellow ones um, that kind of look like a snapdragon. Uh, mm -hmm. Mullen is the big fuzzy one. And so those are all invasive species um, that are quite common and pretty much cover both sides of the trail. And the best one and the worst one is multiple rows. So this one kind of stretches oh, about the entirety of the trail and hopefully we can get this knocked back um, and let some of those better crops grow. I'm going to do a time check. Um, just kind of in general, there were, I, the botanical species list ended up being about four to five pages long in font 11, and I'm not gonna cover all of those because the winery is still open. <laughs> But there are other species, so you're talking, you're talking bed straw. Um, some of the ones I grabbed, you've got dock. Um, oh, that one's a good one. 
golden alexanders, which is a beautiful spring flower. But because of the time when I walked it, I didn't even see it. Because I walked it in mid-June, and I did another couple walkings. But every time you go out there, you're going to find different flowers. And so I brought a couple books. So if you guys are curious and want to hang out, just feel free to leaf through them. Um, there's also apps on your phone where if you see something, just it never hurts to look because I've looked in the same place multiple times and every time there's something new. Oh, and there is poison ivy out there, so be careful. <laughs> I didn't grab any. All right. Ideally, if the entirety of the trail could look like the backyard of Calvin's house on the right-hand side of there and along the landscape where it's just covered in flowers, that would be awesome. But uh, that's not realistic. And it doesn't support all sorts of habitat. For pollinators, there are species that we are looking to introduce into the trail, and that includes butterfly milkweed, swamp milkweed, um, coreopsises, um, Cory Mountain Mint that has one of the best smells of mints, um, and then the Pensamin digitalis. So that Pensamin digitalis, it's not the same as a foxglove. It's, if you think about the two together, so foxglove, um, foxglove is your non-native and Pensamin digitalis is a much better looking alternative that is native. Um, for pheasants and for birds. You need habitat for, I've, I've, there are raccoon prints, there are fox prints, there are oh, all sorts of prints. Uh, the animals, they need shelter and they need food sources. And so for ducks and waterfowl, some of these sedges and uh, bromes are excellent food sources. Um, that high grass that we grow everywhere around Crawford County, wonderful habitat. The number of bucks I push out during combine season, you wouldn't believe. <laughs> and then again, for birds, and again, for habitat and shelter, it's, and it's introducing species that do have a chance to compete. And some of these shrub species do something like that. So instead of planting your, your barbary, your euonymus, um, some of those shrubs, something like an elderberry, a winterberry, a red osier dogwood, um, there's, there's different species that are better alternatives to the current landscaping that I'm not saying, I actually haven't driven around Conneaut Lake much, so I don't know how much is planted around there, but it's making the choices that say, hey, I'm going to plant native shrubs around my house. So I don't have Japanese barberry coming out onto the trail. Oh, here's one. There we go. So this, this one was just right around the corner. And it's one of those things where if there's the fewer plants that end up out there and get dumped out, the better chance that the native species will compete. For example, the pack <laughs> <laughs> well, we have one more slide. All right, so we'll wrap it up with that. That'll be my time check. Another glass of wine. Let's for a glass of wine. So, um, as Calvin was saying, so on the left-hand side is the bridge uh, that we are putting, uh, covering across of uh, Watson Run, and so you can see the old lentils from the railroad. Um, those are the big uh, concrete structures, and then Katie, let yes. me explain this a little bit. This is this is a, a concrete bridge piers that were built in 1920. These plank were laid under the canal when they built a stone arched bridge over the canal, and the canal ran through a dirt channel on top of a stone arched bridge, and and those are over about 200 years old in the bottom there, and and the water's down right now enough that it, you can see them. <laughs> well, Calvin, um, that was kind of all I had had, was running through some of those different species. Um, we got the Virginia creeper showed up, 
uh, St. John's wort. Again, these are, oh, I'm not gonna, that's gonna start burning. I'll clean those up. <laughs> uh, St. John's wort, uh, Barbary. Uh, we've got your GMs, and so this one, I had one that was blooming, uh, but it's, and so many thorns. Um, I grabbed some of that multi rose, but, it was an awesome survey, and I'm still finding stuff every single time I go out there. So I might have to go out more and keep on expanding on that. So thank you. Thank you very much. This is the original um, feeder canal that was used to add water to Conyet Lake from French Creek. Okay. So it raised the level of the lake so that the so that the water would flow so it could flow in, north in, in. into the over the summit okay. in 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 Summit Township. Look at the green stuff. Look at the green stuff on the water. So that green material is actually what they call duckweed. Yeah, duckweed. And duckweed, and it's an excellent uh, food source for wildlife and 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 uh, uh, producing oxygen. For the water. Okay, well that's interesting. Somebody's boat. We we have this we have this pontoon boat here, so that people can get put um, canoes or kayaks into this into the swamp. The water seemed to be awful low to work real well, but uh, it's uh, it's available and anybody can use it. Okay. Yes. Well, that's interesting. So yep. it permanently it permanently stays there. Yes. Okay. Yes. Let me tell you a little bit about the history right here. So, there's, there's actually was two tracks here at one time. Uh, this one, this one side, we've actually added um, banked on gravel and rolled it in. But this is what the surface looked like under the tr track when the railroad was on it. That material right there, slag and uh, uh, but mostly slag. And so. A lot of the surface is quite dark. When we get down where we haven't put the, the uh, bank run gravel on, the uh, you'll see the black surface. There's a there's a there's an interesting thing that's coming to this area, and and these leaves are. This is um, beech, and 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 the leaves actually are that not natural. And they're getting a disease um, that that could affect the species, just like like some other woodland diseases have been. And they're probably diminished the amount of a beech that grows in in this area. Is it what the yellow spots no, are on it? Well, it's actually a, the the best symbol of it is this like this wrinkled leaf right up here. All curled up. Yeah, I don't know just what made those colors. That might have been an insect. That followed up to eat it there. A, a, a year ago, this whole area was pretty much a invaded with uh, multiflora rose and, and fallen trees and, and dead ash and stuff like that. And actually, a little better example of the canal is right here. That was about how wide it originally was, right here, the original canal. One of the woodland species that we see here that's common along the trail is um, is this cohosh, black cohosh. And, and it likes to come after trees have been cleared in northwestern Pennsylvania. It comes in as a, as a, a, a new vegetative material, or if there was a fire in the area, it would come back. So how do you get rid of the multi floral rose? It, uh, cutting it off consistently is about the only way, or there are some chemicals, but I don't, we try to fight it mostly with cutting it. I saw a thing on the news, I saw a thing on the news one time that, that yeah. was a nursery up at the yeah. college up there. Yes. They, they had goats and they were like, like yeah, making a little uh, yeah. for the goats to eat them, to eat the multi floor they, so. they, they seem to like multi floor rows. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I just don't have any goats. <laughs> I, can't, I can't imagine 
Huh? Any anything could eat those things without you know getting their mouths ripped off. Yeah, you know? you'd think so. Here's some of the collage just about ready to go into bloom. You see, it'll have a, a very top. The blooms are coming up on the top of it. That's what those little buttons are there, huh? Yes. See, there's a, there's a bunch of them in there because the sunlight has gotten into that area. Those are doing real well. There are also many non-native, but sort of just uh, actually agriculture related uh, species along here like the dock, the, the, what they call curly dock, and there's sweet clover and, and dame's rocket. Um, they're not really bad plants, they're just not native. Is the clover a popular with animals to eat that? Uh, that? A lot of animals eat the clover, That's yes. What I thought, yeah. and, and, it, and it builds up nitrogen. There's a there's another uh, a yard uh, flower, a fox that's normally called foxglove, and there's a few plants all along. Again, uh, quite often those kind of plants are associated with the railroad and people coming through and throwing things out, and and there it is. Uh, so that's foxglove. Now there's there's a mullen, which is a. a, a Pretty interesting plant, and, and um, this is um, poke, poke weed, and that's actually a native and uh, has a sort of a toxic uh, seed on it for children to eat. We see some of the ferns along here that are common on the trail. Yep. A lot of times when we came, there was a lot of this, like that tree was cleared out across the, the road, you know, and then we had to clear that stuff out. I know we all like to talk about thistles. This would actually be a, a North American native thistle called pasture thistle. I, I, I never, I hadn't recognized that was here before, but that's a, a native. There's very similar non-native thistle, but that's a, in the seed, Spikes at the end of the at the end of the leaf, right? Yeah, oh yeah, they're sharp. Yes, and um, it makes a great habit pollinator habitat for, for certain butterflies. Even though it's very rare, um, there's some butterflies really uh, use that as a, a pollen source. Here's another interesting plant. This is um, called Touch Me Not, and it's a it's an annual. That, that germinates, if you get poison ivy or bee stings, it's a lot like the aloe plant in that the juice from it, you can rub on your skin and it will um, relieve itches and stuff like that. A, na a, na a natural thing. But it only grows between frost. It starts right after, in early in the spring, but it'll die with the first winter frost. And th there's another non-native uh, colt's foot not really that obnoxious it's just a, another one of the plants you find along railroads came out of Japan oh my goodness. <laughs> and in Japan it grows about this tall here it seems to stay real short well actually I think this is a good time to talk about some of the things that we would see throughout the whole trail all the way to Meadville is that you're, you're between, often you're between a, 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 the, the, the swamp, which is going to lay out here to, the, to our right, but then the hardwood forests are also intermixed with it, so we have red oak and white oak uh, and, and hard maple and soft maple. Then some places along the swamps they have a lot of hemlock, and uh, one of the things I, we mentioned about the beach disease, but we also had a lot of ash growing and the ash seemed to take over on the railroad bed extensively but then it died with the with the uh, emerald ash borer and so um the, the, we really had to deal with a lot of falling over trees that were dead because of the because the the railroad itself sort of attracted the, the ash because it's an early secession type tree but then it died there on us so 
We have to deal a lot with the dead ash, and there's still a lot of issues along the trail with the dead ash falling on the trail that we haven't removed yet, but we're, we're trying to keep them back, you know, 30, 40 feet if we can. It's, a, it's an ongoing process, though, to, to keep the ash back. Let me go back to this mullen plant. Um, when, when um, in the fall, the mullen plant will be about four to six feet tall, and if you if you break it off, and, and, and it's got a very fuzzy, woolly surface to it, and that is very flammable, and you can actually make it to make a stick to make heat enough to start a fire. It's, they're also called fire sticks. This in the fall, not not when it's green and wet like this right now. This right is a a, a geological survey monument, and 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 1935 that was set there. Um, I don't think that one was set on plastic pipe. No, that might be steel pipe. But there's actually four of them on the trail from here to to, to Bailey Road. And there's going to be one about two, three hundred feet. Then there's one on the bridge where we, where we're planning to put the bridge across Watson Run Road. And then there's another one on uh, at the at the old Vernon Station, which is on Brown Hill Road. And it's a it's a uh, it's set just set in a cement pier. So there seems to be different ways they've set them. On the railroad bridge, they cemented it into the to the pier of the bridge, but uh, uh, but these seem to be on stakes, the ones right along here. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look them up, you can figure, you, you can get this serial number and then you can look on the uh, GIS or the geological survey maps and figure out exactly what the elevation is right there. Now this to our right here is, is an example of of Conneaut Marsh in, 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 in pretty much in a pristine condition. Um, this is part of Game Land 213, and they have about 5,000 acres of, of this kind of swamp land uh, that runs on the, uh, pretty largely on the south side of the trail. You'll see a lot of their monuments along the trail where they've mapped it off, and um, uh, it's wonderful duck hunting, wildlife, uh, you know, waterfowl can come in, in the, during the year and use it. This water stays quite stable at that level. This is quite typical how multiflora rose uh, is here, uh, and here it's on the bank. But the, the critical thing about multiflora rose is that the barbs are, 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 so that when you try to pull away from it, they pull into your skin. And that's what makes it so nasty. Most common roses just have a straight barb and uh, domestic roses. But And this is not a native of the United States, but it's been introduced here for wildlife habitat, but it's um, overtaken a lot of areas. There's also a, a bittersweet on right back here that, that's also considered invasive because it, it's a vine. This vine is bittersweet. See, it's coming up on things, and it, it gets around the trees, and um, it, it makes that swirled vegetation on, 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 on other vegetation, but um, it's also invasive because there's a native bittersweet, but this is a non-native bittersweet, uh, just not preferred by wildlife people. We can see here in the ashes, these are these are locations there and here where uh, turtles, uh, snapping turtles, come up here and lay their eggs in this sand, and normally in sand, this black ash makes a real fast high, er, uh, incubating place for them because the heat of the of the trail itself or the or the dirt itself incubates the eggs and they hatch there naturally then. And you see here's a, here, I didn't know this was coming up. Now, actually a coon has probably dug in and eaten those right here. 
There might be an egg or so there that's still alive. I don't know. Yeah, I see it. No, don't, just leave it alone. Um, you see, this, this water, this body of water, quite uniquely still, even though that's not feeding into Conyet Lake, it's basically seven feet right now, seven feet above Conyet Lake, and maybe eight feet or so above the Conyet Marsh. That body of water right there is higher by that much than Conyet Lake. And if they would dig through uh, Lakeview Ford, in a way it'd go. <laughs> when, when before the canal was built, this was that level. And then when the canal was built and they put this dike in to hold the water to run into Conyet Lake, this raised it up. Now there's some other things out in here. We're going to see some nice patches of of um, splatter dock and then and then you have some arrow arrow uh, arrow leaf uh, duck potato there in that little corner right there in the middle or a relative of it that, that doesn't really have an arrow leaf on it but there's there's several of them and I can't tell you exactly that one this little grass growing on the on the berms of that um, of that wetland there are what they call lesser burr reed. You see the little burrs coming up there on that one over there? So that's, um, uh, in, in the fall, our company picks, picks them through some of the swamps we own that, uh, and sell those. Because that's a real good early, because somehow once the beavers, well we just, you have to understand, we just put this in last fall. So therefore, this is a little different water. We didn't change the water level at all. The, 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 the culvert we put in would allow for flow, but basically the, the beaver controlled the flow right there at that little outlet right there. And so it's, uh, um, that's the way the level, level's carried here. Um, if you go back 30 years, the, the gravel company actually dug it out and had the water clear down to that level for a while. Th this, is, this is the extensive incontinent marsh, these, these uh, splatter docks. And they grow in about three feet of water, and they have a very high energy root with them that uh, um, muskrats and, and beavers and what have you can eat, but um, it's actually edible for humans too if they wanted to go in there and dig it out. I, I see some other interesting things. Um, I don't know whether uh, anybody knows black nightshade. Okay, the, the, the fruit on this is also very poisonous for kids to eat and what have you. And then there's your natural gra grapes, just native old grapes, and blackberries, and uh, uh, we're go Solidago. Uh, that's a that's a goldenrod coming for this fall. I know a lot of people like sassafras, so we have we have sassafras along the trail here, uh, quite a few trees, and you know it has that real aromatic uh, smell to it, and uh, you can make sassafras tea from the roots or parts of the bark. You can ha chew on a little bit, try it, and then and uh, this is just an elm tree. There's quite a bit of slippery elm also on the area. This is a rather uh, uh, high value alder called gray alder. Has these cones and has a, has a nice light seed on it. Uh, a lot of people like to use those for Christmas tree decorations. You know, in a miniature Christmas tree. But uh, the gray alder is pretty rare and this whole bank along here has, has consistently many, many uh, plants of it in there, along there, of this gray alder. Just surprised me when I found that to be there. Now there's some other things that that we do in as a commercial activity, and and there's there's at least four dogwood species. And when I say dogwood, I'm talking about cornus species. The showy dogwood is common, but the um, uh, this is what they call gray dogwood. It's in bloom right now, right here. 
and it is a wonderful uh, species and and Pennsylvania is using it somewhat as a as the indicator of where they can uh, release woodcocks or or increase the habitat for woodcocks because the understory of it is open you see down in the bottom there that it makes enough shade that the other invasive species don't get in underneath it so this is gray dogwood and I'm going to show you silky dogwood if I can here this this uh, this dogwood uh, uh, member of the family is called redosier dogwood or or um, and you see it's already set seed already this it blooms real early in the spring so there's different times that these these bloom the birds will have these seed eaten as soon as they get ripe and note that but that helps transfer them to some other place so that's redosier dogwood and right now it doesn't look very red in the winter time that'll turn very sh nice deep red and Ernst is a business sell these as a cutting in other words you can take that much of a plant cut this off too I'm, I'm doing I, I do this to sharp shears you put that in the ground it'll grow now one of the things that's happened is beaver also like this they eat it they put it in their their dam and it, rehab, it rehabilitates their grows and it makes roots and make their dam stronger now I'm coming to a, a third kind of dogwood that we also and this is the one of the most common dogwoods in in Pennsylvania. northwestern Pennsylvania Pennsylvania yeah. and this called silky dogwood and we we literally cut millions of pieces of that a year to market in in our business well thank you for joining us today this was a great uh, great learning about the new extension of the Ernst Trail coming west here at the Conneaut Lake. So make sure you, you stay tuned because there's going to be more coverage of, of the rest of the expansion that's going to be coming up. Well, thank you for being with us today and we'll see you next time.